everything recorded when we begin. When you're done recording that, make sure you send one copy to my mother. <laughs> as long as you autograph it. No doubt. Okay, we'll give it one more minute. We got a couple more people jumping in. We're at about 30 people right now. Okay, we're at 702, and there's not a line. Oops, sorry, one more person waiting to grab, to jump in. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and get that going. All right, it's 702. Um, I'm watching multiple screens here as I'm trying to navigate this. I'm gonna begin tonight by welcoming everybody to our July meeting of the Eldorado Hills Area Planning Advisory Committee. I'm the uh, 2020 chair, John Davey. Uh, with us tonight, uh, Brooke Washburn, our, our uh, secretary. Uh, there's John Razlier, vice chair, uh, Tim White, vice chair. We have a couple applicants in for some projects tonight. Supervisor Heidel's here as well. And we're going to get rolling. So um, the first thing we do, and I'm going to grab, I'm going to share this real quick just so we can see where we're at. Sorry. Um, and it's this screen. There we go. So the first thing we do, um, we begin, we call the meeting to order and we have adoption of our meeting agenda. If there's no objection from our APAC um, members, then we'll go ahead and adopt that. Moving right along. Um, as we begin the meeting, we offer an opportunity for public comment from residents in Eldorado Hills on any matter that's not on our meeting agenda. We have a very short agenda tonight in terms of uh, the number of projects, but we'll have a lot of details. So if there are any members of the public that want to uh, make a public comment before uh, that on any item that's not on our agenda for tonight, we'll go ahead now and open that up to see if uh, anybody wants to make any comments. Nobody's raising a hand. You click the raise hand in uh, your Zoom session or if you're on a telephone, if you've dialed in, you can press star nine. If you don't have the raise hand option, like John Reslier has mentioned, you can, uh, there's a chat option. You can send me a chat message and uh, if somebody sees it, if you send it to everyone and I don't see it, somebody yell at me. So that, uh, okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on ahead. The uh, next item on our agenda is that um, at the beginning of our meetings, we have an opportunity to hear uh, from Supervisor John Heidel, our District One Supervisor. Um, with any sort of information from the county that's pertinent for Eldorado Hills, or maybe some information that's sort of countywide, but it's always a, a good learning opportunity for us. And so, John, if you want to go ahead, we'll, yeah, we'll hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, John. And there's two things I wanted to uh, share this evening. The first is the Board of Supervisors has a special meeting tomorrow starting at 2 o'clock, and it deals uh, entirely with the COVID-19 situation and specific uh, focus is on the South Lake Tahoe area where we know that half of the confirmed uh, COVID cases uh, across the whole county have occurred and the numbers are growing rapidly and so our public health officer is very concerned about those things. Uh, there's been mixed response to uh, the governor's uh, executive orders to wear face masks to socially distance uh, and so it's, it's creating a lot of concerns with the possibility of getting to the point that we have more and more people in the hospital and overwhelming our very small Barton Hospital that's up in South Lake Tahoe. A lot of the, um, the influx of people in the South Lake Tahoe is from the state of Nevada. Uh, the state of Nevada is much more open. They've actually had much higher levels of incidence of COVID than we have. 
so that's what the discussion is all about is to listen to um, our public health officer, Dr. Nancy Williams concerns, try to determine how we navigate this with the least damage to the businesses, to people, but still maintain a safe environment for people who are in the safe South Lake Tahoe area and across the whole county. But again, the focus is on South Lake Tahoe. So I would encourage anyone who uh, has an opinion on that, who has specific data, concerns, et cetera, to attend tomorrow's meeting. It'll be also be a Zoom meeting. So a lot of it will be done by uh, phone ins and just uh, opening it up when people have questions and then primarily focusing on Dr. Williams' uh, responses and her thoughts since she's the medical professional in the group and the rest of us will try to follow along and ultimately uh, provide guidance as we feel is appropriate. So that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, relative to planning and development. Uh, the most recent thing that the Board of Supervisors has been exposed to is the new uh, vehicle miles traveled uh, requirements that went into effect July 1st uh, based upon a state law that was passed back in 2013. Taking the state this long to get to the point of saying, okay, now we have to implement it across the board. Uh, the Board of Supervisors recently had a workshop at the last board meeting that kind of started talking about the, uh, the basics associated with vehicle miles traveled as opposed to LOS, LOS, uh, California Highway um, Design Manual has been the standard we've used for many, many years. El Dorado County has through the general plan a requirement to continue to use LOS uh, measurements in terms of vehicle miles traveled relative to traffic and circulation, but no longer in the context of, of meeting CEQA requirements. So CEQA has to be satisfied by VMT parameters, the methodology that's used, the thresholds that are established, but the county also has to do LOS. So it makes it more difficult for a project to navigate through those. Ultimately, I think it's gonna be more expensive for projects, proponents to have to do both, uh, to pay for both those types of analysis. Uh, but the real difficult part of, of VMT is it was designed for very urbanized areas and you can tell that by the mitigation measures, which are include more transit, encourage people to carpool, uh, have more bike paths and those kinds of things. So yeah, if you can live and work in one small community, that's optimum, but that's not the way a rural county operates and never will operate uh, with the exception of, this could lead to you know, the stop of growth in rural areas. And uh, obviously then that puts more and more focus on uh, being able to, to use our community regions for the growth. So. There's a lot to be discussed. The uh, Planning Commission will also have hearings on this, but we're just starting to get into the, the um, nomenclature, the descriptions, a little bit of appreciation for what it's trying to accomplish. And uh, so a lot more to come on it, but again, I would welcome anybody's input who has uh, input on that. Uh, I think it's gonna be uh, somewhat complicated and difficult for a lot of us to truly understand the impacts associated with establishing a threshold for the county and then determining what that means 20 years in, in the future in terms of the reduction of net traffic flow as a result of it. So those are the two major things I wanted to, to touch on. They're both uh, pretty significant things going on in our world these days. And with that, I'll uh, leave it to any questions anybody might have as something more specific that I can respond to. So if anybody has any questions and you're on Zoom, go ahead and press the raise hand button. Um, if you're, um, and I've got to look through my long list of uh, 30 something attendees, don't see anything yet. Um, and if you're on the phone, you can press star nine and that'll send a single I can identify you and you can go ahead and uh, ask your question. I'll kick it off with um, letting people know that if you need the, the, uh, the link to the Zoom meeting for the Board of Supervisors tomorrow, um, we'll go ahead and we'll post it tonight. I, I think it is on the APAC website right now. If it's not, I'll have it there by tomorrow morning. Um, and then the other question I was going to ask was that in terms of that VMT discussion, it's really about um, the impact on the environment of, of vehicle trips. It, it, it's the way I, I kind of remember it from 100 years ago, 2013, but the implementation is kind of messy in terms of the rural or the urban or suburban. Um, right. is, and the net, the net um, intent is to reduce greenhouse gases, air yeah. emissions, et cetera. And you do that by getting people out of their automobiles primarily, right? You, you, you get them into a walking environment, you get them into transit, you get them into carpools. California has attempted to do that for many, many years uh, with a very small degree of success, primarily because people like the independence of driving their automobiles. But the state is getting more and more ambitious about trying to limit our ability to live in the way we have in the past by forcing urbanization, higher densification. So 
just a wave of what's happening. Very good. Uh, John, uh, John Ratzlaff. I saw your hand. Um, I recently received information about VMT from uh, Dan Bolster and from Ramel. And uh, after reading it, the both websites uh, or links, I find that uh, with the uh, VMT, the uh, emphasis has moved from the experience of the driver to the environment. And it seems that no one really has a good plan on how to really base this VMT. It seems that El Dorado County has one uh, a basis for it and uh, a SAC has another one and they don't agree, they don't come together. And I think <laughs> until you actually find the basis to, uh, to implement VMT, uh, this is never going to work. And uh, it also states that even if a project does not meet the standards of VMT, it doesn't count. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. So well, it does. It, to... it can stop projects. So uh, not from what I read, John. It said if if it if they do not meet the standards of whatever VMT standard you use it really has no impact on the project itself. So, you know, I, I, I hurt my eyes reading this stuff. So. Why would the state be pushing something somebody has to pay to do that has no impact? Well, I don't think this that's is, the intent, and I don't think that's the way it's gonna come out in the court of law, so. This is, this is I, I believe this is another, act, another way of uh, implementing, implementing some kind of social plan that they have. They want to have people move away. They want to have people near where they work. Well, <laughs> El Dorado Hills doesn't have a lot of businesses where you can work, that's number one. And number two, El Dorado Hills does not have public transportation that people could take to go to work. So- uh, We do if you commute downtown Sacramento. We do have our transit system and that operates for some people and that's relatively effective, but it's very limited compared to an urbanized community which relies heavily on transit so yeah I and I know exactly so um, that's that's what I wanted to say about uh, VMT. Yeah, and the one thing I take exception to is when the state says that it gets away from uh, being concerned with the driver and wait times and stuff the reason why LOS was put in place in my opinion was to try to keep traffic moving it said once you get to the point of LOSF you have gridlock you have a lot of greenhouse gases being emitted in the day with all a bunch of diesel and gasoline powered automobiles just sitting there spewing smog that wasn't going anywhere, right? And you can't move. Now with electric cars and hybrids and other things, that's diminished a little bit, but, but it's a false statement to think that LOS was only put in place for the convenience of the driver. It was put in place to try to make sure we minimized greenhouse gases and smog, and that's really what VMT is doing, but in a different way that applies primarily to very urbanized areas and not rural areas. That's the conclusion most people have come to. So again, a lot more to come on it. I appreciate the discussion and uh, we'll, we'll understand it better in probably a next, another month, so. Thank you. Yeah, and the one thing you did mention was the legal aspect of it, how it's, in, you, know, you know, the state wouldn't do it unless there's a legal way to enforce it, but it's also a tool for lawsuits. So just like LOS is, so there's that. Um, and when you start something new, though, it really is wide open for all kinds of litigation because there is no standard other than what OPR has recommended. And the OPR recommendations don't work well in rural areas. So that's where we are. Very good. So are there any other questions for Supervisor Heidel? I'm going through my list. I don't see any hands up. Okay, John, I think you're off the hook. Thank you for the time. Yep. Oh, thank you, John. Okay, so the next item on our uh, agenda tonight, let me move this over. Um, I'm gonna grab this and I'm gonna share my screen. Sorry. And there it is. So, tonight we have, uh, Sean, I gotta go back and find Sean on my list. Um, make sure you're unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me, John? Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, 
We're good. Right. So uh, Sean McDermott's here from Lennar Homes, California, and he's going to discuss um, the Heritage of Carson Creek plan. It's a tentative map um, proposal and a specific plan amendment. And I have uh, Sean's uh, presentation here and our presentation. I'm going to advance it here and I'm going to uh, go ahead and let Sean jump in and do a little driving while he yells at me to change the screen. I will change the screen. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, as John said, I'm Sean McDermott, uh, Director of Forward Planning with Lenar, and I want to thank the APAC for giving us the opportunity to present our Heritage Carson Creek project to you here tonight. Uh, this project came before the APAC last year while we were proceeding with our conceptual review uh, with the Board of Supervisors for our J6 application. Uh, the proposed project has not changed significantly um, from that application that went forward. And uh, in November of last year, uh, the board voted to find it consistent with the policies of the, um, J6, the J6 policies. So um, our proposed entitlements, as John had said, are for a tentative, a tentative map and a specific plan amendment. Can you go to the next slide? So this is an overall area aerial that shows the location of the project site outlined in red as well as its uh, main access there to the north off of Investment Boulevard uh, that ties back into Latrobe Road. It's located uh, south of Carson Crossing Drive and uh, directly to the west is Lennar's existing Heritage El Dorado Hills community. Uh, you can see uh, John's cursor is on unit one there and then unit two is to the south where his cursor is now. Uh, the proposed project would have a proposed secondary connection on the southern side of the project site that would run to Latrobe Road, and that would be the second access point for the proposed project, and it's in the location that uh, John has highlighted there. Next slide. So this slide shows a comparison between the existing uh, land use in the specific plan uh, versus the proposed land use. And uh, the project uh, proposes to change 57 acres of industrial and 33.3 acres of research and development land uses to 84 acres um, of residential village, a 3.1 acre community center, and a 1.7 acre of local commercial site located up at the north end of the project. Uh, this project would be an age-restricted community uh, with private streets and a homeowners association that would maintain uh, the landscaping and all of the common area, including the proposed clubhouse that would be located at the community center site. Next slide, please. A couple of the project benefits that I just wanted to briefly touch on is uh, there's a growing need to house aging baby boomers. Um, Lennar has seen a significant increase in desire for active adult communities um, as the population continues to age. One of the things that we're hearing out there in the market is that in these communities, um, active adult communities have a significant de desire for private uh, clubhouse facilities, which we've included here, allows them to have a really um, convenient place to have, you know, social interaction, uh, meet with groups of people. Um, they often form committees and clubs that uh, do all different kinds of events. Um, I have the privilege of serving as the president of the Homeowners Association for Heritage El Dorado Hills. And my favorite part about those Homeowners Association meetings is getting to hear about all the fun events that they've been doing throughout the week and throughout the month. So our intent here is that we would continue that type of lifestyle into this proposed project site. It will be a separate standalone homeowners association from the existing Heritage El Dorado Hills community, but it will have um, you know, similar types of opportunities. This project is well suited for active adult housing. I'll get into that a little further in, in the next slide. Uh, also extends the public trail system allows for regional park connections, um, reduces the oversupply of industrial zoned property. It has an improved, an improved economic impact to the county versus the proposed land uses. And um, I think very importantly, it significantly reduces uh, traffic impacts. 
Next slide, please. So just a couple of quick statistics here. Uh, one of the things that we've looked at is uh, from 2010 to 2030, there's an estimated increase in the 65 to 74 year old category um, from 21.7 million to 38.6 million. Uh, demonstrates it's gonna be a continued growth in terms of that market. And uh, Lennar continues to see that our active adult communities are some of our most popular as the baby boomers continue to age. We're able to do a, no a number of really uh, great things with our homes that we propose in this, we'll be proposing in this particular active adult community in addition to what we've done at Heritage El Dorado Hills, which is it really allows for an aging in place type of a scenario. Uh, we include wider hallways, zero threshold showers, um, things that as individuals within the home age, they'll continue to be able to function within the home. As far as the site goes, it's well suited for active adult, given its flat topography, which is um, relatively rare in the area. Um, so it does, that is an important aspect uh, for an active adult community. And so it, it, it's a good fit for this particular site. Situated adjacent to existing active adult and a future memory care facility. And then uh, it is a smaller school district, um, but, and uh, this proposed project being active adult won't have a significant impact on student generation, um, which is a benefit uh, for it being an active adult site. Next slide, please. Uh, here, this shows the extension of the public trail system. You can see in yellow, uh, that's the proposed extension um, around this project here. Um, down on the south end is the future uh, regional park there, and it does allow for some roadway connect, or I'm sorry, trail connections into the uh, railroad uh, corridor there that's to the west, and it also ties up into the uh, public trail system at the north of the project, which connects in and around um, Heritage El Dorado Hills um, to the existing trail system that exists in that location. So it does provide significant additional connectivity for uh, public trails. While the streets themselves are private, uh, the trail system is and will continue to remain open and accessible to the public. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a conceptual um, image of the regional park site and you can see with the arrows there just demonstrating potential connections to that railroad corridor. Um, we have some additional work to do with the CSD in the county as it relates to what um, uses might be appropriate for that park site and uh, we'll be continuing to meet with them as we proceed. But uh, in terms of the acreage of the site, it's still the 30 acre site that was identified in the specific plan. Uh, no changes are being proposed to the size of that park. Next slide, please. Um, I think one of the keys associated with uh, the proposed project is the significant reduction in traffic. Uh, you can see here as it relates to daily trips, the approved specific plan land uses would generate approximately 32,000 uh, trips, whereas the pros, proposed project um, would generate approximately 55% less or about 14,000 trips. Next slide. And the same thing is demonstrated with the uh, PM peak hour reduction. The approved specific plan is about 2,800 um, PM peak trips with the proposed project at just over 1,100. Um, so from that standpoint, uh, we think it's a, it's a good fit for the area. It'll help reduce uh, traffic over the long term versus the approved specific plan land uses. Really, we see this as an opportunity for a continuation of the successful community that we have out at Heritage El Dorado Hills. Um, while it will be a standalone community, it will be modeled very much after um, the community that we're currently in the midst of, of constructing and selling. And uh, we think it's a good fit for the area and will be compatible with that existing active adult community uh, located directly to the west. So with that, I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Oh, what happened? Hmm. And I unmute myself, I apologize for that. So are there any questions for Sean about this project? 
Uh, I have some questions, but somehow or other I lost the Zoom. <laughs> oh. Um, I, I, no, I, let's see. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, I got you back, John. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Sean, John Rasslier. Uh, Sean, I'm quite familiar with this uh, area, and I'm very familiar with the Heritage uh, Phase 1 and Phase 2. And uh, I have a few questions that I wanted to ask you. Sure. Uh, your memory care, you mentioned memory care. Where do they plan to put a memory care? Uh, there's a memory care facility that's proposed at the intersection of Carson Crossing Drive and Golden Foothill. It's uh, right at the corner there, um, adjacent to Carson Creek Unit 3. Uh, that project is not being uh, developed by Lennar. Uh, it was purchased by a uh, builder um, who intends to ultimately construct a memory care facility in that location. Okay. Uh, I have... I. I'm an ombudsman for the county for assisted living, and we haven't seen any indication that a memory care unit will be put there. Okay, no, li no license, no uh, planning has been provided for that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you, and I asked you at the TAC meeting, the size of your public trails. Did yes. You know, what are they? Uh, it is an eight foot wide uh, public trail. Um, John, I know you brought that up at the TAC meeting and I intended to speak to it in my presentation, but thank you for the reminder. It is eight feet wide. All right. Now I ride that trail and I find that eight feet is really not sufficient. It's too narrow. I just, I'm giving you this, uh, you know, for your information. It's okay. not wide enough. Uh, you have many uh, points in the trail in phase two that have blind corners that you can't see around, which makes them very dangerous. You need a line going down that trail so that people know what side to walk on. So that's just something that I want to bring to your, to your attention about okay. your past. They are just too, they're too narrow and they have too many blind spots. Uh, the other thing I, I wanted to uh, mention is that on Carson's in phase one, I believe you have something called a French drain, which takes runoff water. And that French drain is directly or adjacent to the sidewalk. And uh, I feel, because I walk that, that if I ever fall into that French drain, they're gonna have to come with an EMT to get me out. I'm hoping that you do not have that kind of a French train along uh, sidewalks uh, in uh, this, I'm gonna call it phase three. Okay. All right, I, I wanted to, just wanted to bring that up. Uh, I thank you for looking up the size of the trail and uh, you know, think about making it a little wider. I don't know what the regular uh, size of a trail is, but I know it's not eight, it's not eight feet. It's gotta be wider than that. All right, thank you, Sean. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Okay, uh, Tim White, uh, are you muted? Let me unmute you. I am. You're gonna have to unmute yourself, Tim. <coughs> Hi, Sean. How are you tonight? Doing well. Good. Hey, um, you mentioned that there's a specific plan amendment involved. What specifically is being a, is a request for the amendment? Yeah, so the specific plan amendment just seeks to do a couple of things. The first is to change the land use designations from research and industrial um, to the age restricted residential. The other thing that that specific plan amendment will do is create a new uh, development standard category that applies specifically to this area. The setbacks will be consistent with those of the adjacent community, but the uh, planning department had asked us to consider clarifying the setbacks um, in the older document. They're not quite as clear as they could otherwise be. So that's the second piece of the specific plan amendment, which will seek to clarify those development standards for this particular village. And how many uh, residences are you planning on building? It's uh, proposed to be 415 age restricted homes. Okay, then the in the slideshow, we saw 1,700 and 1,930 homes. Is that 
was that for the entire heritage project in a accumulated or what? Yeah, that was for the entire specific plan area. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Supervisor Heidel has a question. Yeah, Sean, this goes beyond your project, but um, our uh, planning commissioner, John Vania and I have been talking with DOT uh, department um, head, uh, Rafael Martinez about the need for a long range circulator route, essentially a beltway uh, to be implemented that would come across Sacramento County around the backside of the business park, connect somewhere to Latrobe Road, go off through the Marble Valley proposed project and then back to Highway 50. Uh, it was originally conceived and proposed by members in DOT probably 20 years ago when Randy Paces was there. Somehow it got taken out of the long range planning process, but uh, ultimately I think there's a large group of people who think that that connection has got to be made someday to take a lot of the traffic off of White Rock Road, Latrobe Road, et cetera. So, I'm uh, in the process of laying out uh, a routing that I think would make sense. And if you look at what's planned for the, the JPA Southeast connector, i.e. the White Walk Road expansion to four lanes, and we understand what's going on with uh, Empire Ranch Boulevard intersection that the city of Folsom is planning and Empire Ranch, uh, it would make a lot of sense to a lot of us to, to connect from there across Sacramento County, come, where, come in somewhere south of the business park with maybe a spur going into the business park, make the connection to Latrobe and then go off on the other side and connect again to Highway 50 up towards the, the Cameron Park, you know, Bass Lake Road area probably better than Cameron Park, to try to provide an offset for future uh, growth when we start seeing more and more development wanting to occur south of Highway 50. If we look at what's going on with um, BMT and a lot of other things, it's the community regions that are going to expand. And I honestly believe that one of the next places we will see some more interest in this is, is south of Highway 50 going towards Latrobe. It's always been a short of water, but at some point, I, I think that's going to be one of the proposed expansion areas. Again, it's long range planning, but do you have any personal thoughts on an area that we could connect a spur or something into you know, the business park area into your proposed subdivision somewhere in that area that would make sense to at least lay that out in the plan so we can start putting some of these roadway concepts together? I think that's something we can certainly uh, take a look at um, with the county staff. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't, you know, have an answer in terms of a potential location, but to the extent that that's something that the county is interesting, interested in exploring, we can certainly sit down and discuss it with uh, county staff. Yeah, excellent. Because I think, you know, like I said, and John Vane is on the line too, and, and I would wish that he would go ahead and speak his uh, perspective on it because he was with DOT for 20 something, something years. And that was always kind of a thought of need uh, as Eldorado Hills grows. And we know the business park was intended to grow. It hasn't grown at the rate it has, but as we see the, the potential for uh, the Iron Horse, um, public school, the new high school uh, to be built down in that area. We look at Wetzelovia, we look at the, the business segment of that as part of our future. I think we've got to look at where would be an optimum place to put a major circulator road around all of the town center area and still allow people to connect coming in from Amador County and either go to Tahoe or go down to Sacramento, but keep as much of that traffic as we can out of the intersection of White Rock and Latrobe. So thank you for your uh, you're volunteering to help, and if, if Vania would weigh in with some of his thoughts, I think that would also be helpful. Okay, great. And thank you, Supervisor Heidel. Um, yeah, Sean, I've, uh, um, uh, working at DOT, we have uh, looked for ways to get through the business park, you know, ultimately to going to the, um, to the west, getting over to the Empire Ranch interchange has been the uh, intent. And, We've been told for many years for long range planners that we're gonna need three interchanges to be able to serve our South County uh, community. And so um, it, it's always uh, difficult decisions to be made, but I'm of the opinion that it needs to be of a collector arterial type status uh, to be able to uh, plan for that. And, uh, and also as Supervisor Heidel said, to, to you know, possibly collaborate with uh, you know some projects that are coming in Marble Valley, um, 
and uh, and so forth to get to the east as well would be um, we've made various attempts in trying to uh, you know to do that but the route um, I was talking to the developers of your ranch which is now four seasons and uh, you know it was always pushed to the south well we're running out of room here <laughs> in the south and so um, so I look forward to working with uh, with you guys and Supervisor Heidel and DOT as it relates to that. So thanks for the time. Thank you. Um, uh, I don't see any other hands up. I'll throw a question on that. The the roads and the business parks, they're private roads. Does anyone you know, speak to that? The roads in the business park are public roads. Most they're of public, them are okay. public roads. They're not like town center. Yeah, investments, uh, county road, okay. all of the uh, major entrances and internal, most of them, not all, but most of them are county maintained roads. But yeah, they're not. A major overlay down there about uh, two years ago. So that's why some of the roads got pretty nice down there. It's a great place to teach your kids to drive. Um, I, I've done that before. And uh, grandkids. <laughs> um, we got a brand new permit in the house today. Um, uh, uh, John, I wanted to address something Razzler had brought up with Sean. Sure. The width of the uh, bike path, the class one bike path, which is what you see alongside the roads that are separated from the roadways, those are class one bike paths, and uh, which I think is what we're talking about here. And those are, it's a multi-use trail for pedestrians and bikes, and they are typically eight feet in width. Now, that doesn't mean that you could provide some additional width for maybe the bikes that don't want to be on the pavement. They want to be, you know, in the native land. So you could provide some additional shoulders, but not necessarily additional pavement. So that might be an approach to take. And, and I'm guessing there's probably some equestrian interest uh, down in that part of the county that you know, might want to consider some additional native trails maybe uh, adjacent to that paved path. So I just thought I'd put that out there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Are there any other questions for Sean on this project? Oh, uh, John, I, I'd like to add something. Uh, Investment Boulevard is the entrance to uh, probably one of the biggest employers in El Dorado Hills, uh, Broadridge. And it's also the entrance now, one of the entrances to phase two. Okay, so now phase three will be using this one entrance. And uh, it seems to me it's going to put an, a, a great amount of traffic onto Latrobe, on and off of Latrobe, especially when it hits White Rock Road and Latrobe, which is jammed now at uh, what used to be rush hour. And this is why I mentioned at the TAC meeting that there should be another road uh, going up into and meet White Rock Road where the connector will be and to go into the uh, Empire Ranch Road. And uh, the gentleman that represented uh, DOT said yes, just like John said, they looked at it a long time ago and they kind of dropped it, but uh, that they would look at it again. So uh, that's something I think that's on the books and something that's necessary. Thank you. Yeah, I believe it. Oh, uh, Richard Ross. Yes, a uh, couple questions. Um, I hear the trails identified as public trails. Is there public parking? There would be public uh, proposed public parking at the future park site. Uh, there is no proposed public parking along the trail itself. So the future park site. What is the proposed timeline by CSD that that will be a park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we have not had any discussions with the park district as it relates to the timing of that park being constructed, uh, but it is something that we intend to continue to discuss with the CSD um, and the county as well in terms of timing for making that park um, available. Given the known priorities of the Bass Lake Park, basically absorbing all available funding, um, it would seem that a South El Dorado Hills Park is quite, quite, quite distant in the future. And if there's no parking at all, 
then to refer to those as public trails, I think, is misleading and a misnomer. Okay, uh, we do get significant use from the public um, walking through the business park as it relates to the existing trail system. Um, so it does provide that public uh, connectivity and is, in, is currently in use. Uh, this would extend it further, um, but I appreciate your comments. Next question I have is the, the traffic uh, comparisons that were made as to what is uh, presently in the general plan and what's going to happen. Um, given the fact that the development of the commercial and the research center basically has gone, not gone anywhere near where that proposed level of traffic would have been. Um, and in the short term, you're going to be adding a lot of new vehicles that frankly just don't presently exist in the nature of the way the area is. Uh, how capable are these feeders such as Latrobe Road and White Rock Road in absorbing that kind of peak traffic? Maybe Vigna or, or Mr. Heidel has some observation on that. And I'd be happy to speak to it from the project perspective. We're doing a detailed traffic study that will look at the impacts of the trips generated by the proposed project on those roadways. Uh, that traffic study is currently underway um, and we will have the results of it and uh, there will likely be um, some modifications necessary to a couple of key areas. Um, but the traffic study will identify the trips that are utilizing those roadways and what the required improvements are um, to mitigate for those impacts. Last question I have would be recognizing that there are many variables presently in our economy. Do you have a particular timeline relative to the full build out? Uh, the full build out, we have a couple of different uh, product lines that we're proposing. Uh, typically, we would estimate that um, we would absorb approximately um, eight home sales uh, per month. And as a result of that, it would just, uh, typical build out would be, uh, what does that put it at? That would be approximately five years um, for a community of this size. Um, the pace of sales at our existing Heritage El Dorado Hills community has exceeded expectations and has been great. Um, if that was to continue, we would anticipate approximately five years to build out this particular area. Thank you. Thank and to you. follow up on the uh, timeline question, uh, do you have a timeline for perhaps the uh, draft environmental, environmental impact report when you might be eyeing, you know, moving the project along to like perhaps the planning commission um, is it a one year, two year, you can't define it yet, you have to wait for the environmentals or? Yeah, so currently um, the environmental document consultant is preparing a draft schedule that will be reviewed both by the county and the applicant. That schedule is not yet available, but should be available shortly. Um, our goal would be to proceed with the environmental document and, you know, in expedited fashion uh, and then work with the county to schedule the public hearings at the soonest available date. Uh, but I don't have specific dates for you at this time, but I'd be happy to keep you in the loop, John, as it relates to the timing of those future hearings. Certainly. All right. Are there any more questions for Sean? Uh, John, I have John Rice there again. Uh, looking at my notes, I have two questions that were asked by residents of uh, the President uh, Heritage uh, Two. One of them is, does the LLAD, is it in district... 39. Can you answer that, Sean? Um, I cannot answer that at this time just because I know it's something the CSD is looking at. Um, this project will be responsible for um, entering into some sort of financing district to cover the maintenance of parks um, throughout the CSD. In terms of specifically what form that will take, that will require further coordination with the CSD and we're committed to doing that. So I can't answer that question specifically at this time. Uh, based on the response the Park District gave at the TAC meeting, my understanding is that they are considering that, but um, it will require further review. My second, second uh, uh, thing I'd like to ask is that the people in Heritage 2 are very concerned with the noise that's coming out of Broadridge 
uh, when they run uh, their air cleaning systems. And uh, I know it's been promised that uh, Broadstone, uh, Broad Ridge, and I believe Lennar are going to work on a better system that doesn't make as much noise. Uh, I would like to see that really in writing when you do uh, a particular plan. The people in Heritage would like to see that. Okay, I can uh, speak to that um, specifically here. Um, Lennar submitted a building permit application with the support of Broadridge for some uh, sound attenuation measures on the rooftop of that particular facility. Lennar has been working closely with Broadridge uh, probably for the last six months or so to work through that. Uh, the building permit for uh, the measures was actually just recently approved and the expectation is that those sound attenuation measures will be installed in the next uh, 60 to 90 days. So we should have some uh, good progress on that very soon here, um, even in advance of this project moving forward to a public hearing. All right, thank you very much, Sean. Thank hey, you. Yeah, looks like uh, Joel, has, Joel Wiley has a question. Uh, Sean, a couple of questions on, on the uh, park. Uh, is, that, is that gonna be a public park? Yes, it's a planned public park. Okay, who's going to be paying for it? Hmm. Uh, I, I'm wondering because the current park that they're building in Heritage now is being um, apparently paid for by the people in Heritage, uh, but it's a public park. And um, I was wondering uh, why, the, why they would be paying for it themselves when it's a public resource? And what, do, what ramifications does this have for the new park? Yeah, well, at each community that Lennar has developed has been required as a condition of approval by the El Dorado Hills CSD to participate in park maintenance um, through a funding source uh, that's developed uh, prior to uh, homes being uh, conveyed to individual home buyers. And so that was done for Heritage El Dorado Hills and the same thing will be required here in terms of specific allocation of maintenance dollars to a regional park. Uh, that is something that we would have to further explore with the parks district, but these residents of this proposed community would be required to pay um, you know, their share for park maintenance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, seeing no more hands, I think that uh, we can thank you, Sean, for your uh, presentation tonight, and um, we'll look forward to learning more about it, and if there's any minor updates you want to convey to us and we can share at a future meeting, we'll uh, do that if it doesn't require a full presentation, and I just want to thank you for being here tonight. All right. Thank you so much, Sean. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So we're moving along. Uh, the next item on our agenda tonight uh, would be the Montana de El Dorado phase two. Um, and the applicant, Vinyl Perk, comes here tonight. He just unmuted himself. Um, Vinyl, do you want anything on the screen right now that I have, or do you just want to start by discussing it? I, uh, I'm, I'm on the screen now. I just clicked on. I just want to thank Supervisor Heidel for being here uh, and, uh, and appreciate, uh, appreciate everybody uh, uh, listening to the project. I was here last month uh, to describe the project along with uh, Tom Purcell, uh, county planner, and then uh, we uh, went into a uh, uh, planning commission workshop last uh, last week, I believe, or week before last. So um, I, I know that uh, I was asked to come back to uh, receive uh, further questions regarding the project. Um, you know, just as an overview, uh, I am the super the uh, the supervising developer for the Montano de El Dorado Shopping Center uh, here in El Dorado Hills at the corner of La Trobe and White Rock Road, uh, southeast corner. Um, the first phase was built in 2007, um, uh, consisting of four buildings, about uh, 45,000 square feet of gross leasable square footage, purely retail. Uh, it turns out that most of that retail ended up being service oriented, which, uh, which we very much en enjoy, especially with the onset of Amazon. Uh, in 2012, we went ahead and moved forward to build the U.S. Bank. Um, and that is building E1010 White Rock Road, where the arrow is. And that is adjacent to the Post Street entrance 
uh, fully lit intersection that connects our shopping center with town center. And what we are proposing now is, uh, and we've been working on this since 2013, we are looking at uh, uh, developing out the remainder of the 16 plus acres between Latrobe Road and White Rock Road to the north and Monte Verde Latrobe Road to the south. Within that 16 acres, there is going to be eight retail buildings, um, predominantly um, a, uh, of the same nature. There we go, thank you. Uh, predominantly of the same nature as the existing buildings. If you see the buildings in blue or lavender, you might say, buildings A, B, C, D, and E, those are the, that's phase one. That was already built in 2007 and 2012. What we're looking for now is with these eight buildings, we're also looking to, uh, to construct a, a four-story Marriott Spring Hill Suites hotel. Um, we, did, uh, we did just very quickly here, we did a couple of studies. I did an internal studies of all of the area hotels uh, in Folsom, the impacted areas within five miles of the site. And uh, it shows that El Dorado Hills is in dire need of um, hospitality, something that we can uh, compete with Folsom. Folsom is uh, quite congested, as you know, uh, you know in the uh, East Bidwell at, uh, at um, Iron Point Road. Uh, however, we only have one hotel here and that's the Holiday Inn. There is another hotel that is being proposed in town center called Eloft, Eloft. Uh, more of a lower end hotel, but again, that's another Marriott. Our Marriott Spring Hill Suites is more tailored towards the business traveler, uh, tying into uh, you know folks who are you know not only uh, doing leisure travel but also uh, can come here and stay for business where they have many suites throughout. Um, along with that, uh, we have uh, with our anchor space. Uh, we are looking for another main entrance at Latrobe at uh, Post Street. This is the Post Street at Latrobe, which we're, as Supervisor Heidel had discussed, you know, we're really looking for expansion of development. However, we do want to try to do our best to disperse the traffic coming and going out of White Rock Road and Latrobe Road. Whether you're coming from County Line at the new Folsom Ranch, going eastbound across County Line, or coming north uh, from you know south of Monteverde, the new growth areas in, in uh, South El Dorado Hills, moving north, we're hoping that with the with the construction of a new lighted intersection and the new Post Street, we can encourage vehicles also not only to come in and enjoy our our project, our, our retail center, but also it gives them the opportunity to move through Post Street from Latrobe Road and connect up with White Rock Road at Post Street, uh, thereby diverting away from Latrobe and White Rock Road and moving straight forward through the light into Town Center, or even taking a right and hitting Highway 50 at, uh, at uh, the Silva Valley um, new interchange. Um, you know, small retail space, we do have an amphitheater that I'm sure we're going to discuss. Uh, we have one drive-through restaurant at the main entrance. Thank you, that's, uh, that's uh, building number seven. And the largest building would be a 29,900 square foot mini anchor space building number eight on Latrobe Road. So uh, that being said, the architecture of the buildings, um, the, the relief patterns of the buildings, the, uh, uh, the circulation, uh, we've we've really patterned it towards the first phase, and I think uh, it, it it lends itself uh, to uh, you know being you know, I, I guess I could say that we're quite lucky that we've got a first phase that people can actually see and they can um, they can imagine what the second phase is going to be like. So we're hoping that we're going to do a better job in the second phase uh, versus the first phase. I'd like to have less compact parking than we got in the first phase. And uh, it's going to have um, all of the, you know, the elements of uh, LED lighting. Um, you know, uh, we're going to have uh, spaces for electric cars. 
uh, and we're actually going to be coming back into the first phase and replacing our incandescent lights to match the LED lights that are night sky friendly for our neighbors in the second phase. Um, and so this project isn't going to happen overnight. It's probably going to happen over the course of maybe three years. And we're hoping that we can build the hotel first and basically do the grading next year if we're, if we're lucky enough to do that. So what we're asking uh, of county is we're looking to do a plan development overlay um, on, the on the existing um, zoning, which is zoned regional commercial. Uh, and we are going to be doing lot lines, uh, lot splits for each building. Um, and uh, there was something else that I can't remember now that what we're going to do, but that's, uh, that's basically uh, you know, the project at 60,000 feet. So if there's any, uh, if there's any questions or uh, anybody that wants to have, I know that ask me do. any questions. I'm certain we will have a lot of questions. Um, let's see. I know that we have a subcommittee working on this has been evaluating it. A lot of residents have spoken about it. And I know that John Razlier and Christy have both been working um, and are reviewing the project. Um, if I, either, would like to, I would like to speak. Go ahead and jump in, John. Okay. Uh, hi, Vinyl. I've met you before uh, several times, I believe. Yes, sir. At the site. And <clears throat> I'm calling up on my, on my screen uh, some of the concerns uh, of the residents that live adjacent to uh, to this project and their biggest concern is the amphitheater yes and uh, when you look at your map and you look at that amphitheater you can see that sound can travel right over their homes it can travel to Blackstone it can travel to uh, four seasons and I believe even to people who live behind Walgreens uh, because there's no real uh, buildings to block, no high structures to block uh, music coming out of that amphitheater. I do know that <clears throat> Relish Burger a ways back uh, got permission to have certain types of music at certain times and at certain decibels. And you may want to look at, uh, you know, what they have what kind of an agreement they came with the county. I do know that uh, Relish Burger has been <coughs> cited a few times for not meeting those uh, particular uh, restrictions on their music. I, I kind of, and I think many of the neighbors that live adjacent to that project would like to see something else other than an amphitheater. Uh, perhaps you're gonna build some restaurants in there, you're gonna have some businesses, perhaps some kind of a garden area where people can sit, have lunch, possibly bring their kids up, maybe have a little fountain kind of a thing where the kids can get wet on a hot day, uh, rather than the amphitheater. Uh, I certainly believe you're going to have trouble uh, trying to get this amphitheater across to the, uh, to the, to the people who live in the area. <laughs> the other thing is for operations, uh, seven in the morning, this is for the whole area, seven in the morning till 10 at night. Uh, I, I think that's kind of tough for the people who live there, seven in the morning. It should go uh, probably maybe from seven in the morning and then stop maybe at seven at night uh, so that you don't interfere with the people who live adjacent to it. Uh, their other concern is the hotel. Now, I saw somewhere that the hotel is described as a 70 foot building, 70 feet high. Am I wrong in that? Yes, you are, sir. Okay, so how, how high will the building be? It'll be within toleration. It'll be within 50 feet. Within 50 It'll feet. It'll be right at, right at 50 feet with the architectural design. It, it's actually built within a hillside. So if you look at the hotel from, by the way, everything we're talking about here, I've got certain pictures. If I could get my screen uh, enabled. Let me go ahead and it's grab that. Um, Host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah, I gotta go find it, sorry. <laughs> okay, so just uh, just moving on while you're doing that, uh, you know, there were several things that I had uh, 
uh, attachments that hopefully would come through. But with the hotel, if you look at the hotel from the Latrobe Road side, uh, Montano, the name Montano is there for a reason, and that's we weren't given the luxury of having a flat shopping center, you know, of having a flat, a flat surface in which to build, and it's quite expensive to begin with. But when you look at Latrobe Road, it actually is up against the hillside, so it looks as it is on one side, it's five stories. But in order to fit that hotel and get the appropriate rooms to make it feasible, we actually had to engineer a road that encircles it. Of course, the fire department requires that as well. But actually on the back side of the hotel, you're on the second level of the hotel and it's only four stories. And a typical hotel would be 124 rooms where we've knocked our hotel down to 100 rooms, which also includes um, a, um, an area for events, an event center. Uh, so, you know, the last time I went up to take a look at where this project is going to be, uh, it seemed to me that the hotel would be very close to the crest of this hill. And uh, I would really like to see some kind of line of sight uh, study being done on this hotel to see actually what it's going to look like uh, from Latrobe and maybe from the entrance to uh, to the community in, in, Mont in uh, Monteverde. Yeah, I'm hoping that, you know, with, with that coming out, even as a developer, the more, the more uh, I can see in, in terms of the relief patterns and, and how it looks, uh, it would be better for even us to see that. Um, we've got a few line of sight examples and I talked to our, um, uh, our EIR consultant and, um, a couple of other consultants that worked with this on that, and that was addressed in the EIR. And so it's very possible that moving forward as we get into our construction drawings, uh, you know, architects do have computer capabilities now. Of course, everything costs money, but they have computer capabilities of lining in those buildings so you can do fly arounds, basically. Um, and, and I'm hoping that we can get to that level. It, it is a a large enough project where I think it's feasible and it's something that uh, uh, I, I think the neighbors should understand and, and see. So uh, in, in placing that hotel where, where it is, I did angle it, we angled it, uh, and our team angled it to the best position possible. So at the back end and the front end, um, is more aligned towards the residents, so it's not just sitting there flat, flat faced against the residents uh, behind it. All right. I, so. I, I also want to mention uh, about this amphitheater. Uh, we also believe that you're going to need uh, additional security by the sheriff mm -hmm. to patrol this uh, amphitheater, especially in the evening hours where it would become yeah. a magnet for young people to go in and to enjoy. And uh, we, we're always short of sheriff uh, deputies in El Dorado Hills, but uh, I can just see how that is going to add uh, an extra burden to the sheriff. Yeah. Uh, I really, your neighbors really think you should look for an alternative, such as a garden setting with benches that could be used by patrons, especially using the planned restaurants and offices that you have. I think they think it would be a bigger draw all day long rather than just uh, an amphitheater. Um, well, John, uh, it, you know, with this amphitheater, it, it's not a very large one to, be, to begin with. And, and actually, when we put this together, it, we basically did it for the community. And it's, uh, it's uh, you know, something uh, where we were just looking for the opportunity to have certain events once in a while within the plaza and, and you know for the community it's not anything that we're going to be making any money on it's just simply something that can be used for the community such as the El Dorado Music Theater the kids that are over there looking for places we uh, you know we see it uh, possibly being a venue for a, a bridal show or you know or just different small events within the community 
Um, I, I don't really see it uh, performing in the way that Town Center has its amphitheater. Um, all it is is just a stage. So um, it's a staged area and we ended up, thank you for doing that. <clears throat> so so the, the planning department came up and they said, look, you need to put a, uh, you need to put a, an event program together. So we did the best that we could, could to just pull out all the stops. We're not going to be having all these all the time. These are just potential events that go on. So, and there is going to be restrictions. We understand that. Um, so, uh, you know, and when it comes to security also, one of the problems that we've had in the, in the existing shopping center, we've got 40,000 feet of retail over there. As nice as it looks, we don't have enough, enough gross leasable area to have on-site security unless we just have occasional drive-through security that randomly comes through the plaza, which, which is typical of that size plaza. Once you get to a larger plaza, your gross leasable area triples in size. The tenants can handle, the landlord and the tenants can work together to handle that security. We plan on backfilling our surveillance. Once we get the, the, uh, the, the leasable area and this shopping center put together, that justifies us being able to get our cameras out there, being able to have video surveillance. I don't know how many times things have happened in this shopping center and I wish I've, I've had it. We've tried, but I hate, I, you know, it's, it's a metaphor, but basically we have an over glorified strip center at this time and we need more gross leasable area to justify the additional things that we need to have in our shopping center. So with this amphitheater, it's an area basically just a stage for people to make presentations, for kids to do their thing, uh, for occasional celebrations. Uh, as you've seen in our event program. And I clearly know that there are going to be times in there, and uh, I expect it, where we're not going to be able to get amplified music, where we are going to have to shut down at a certain time. But I just hope that we have enough flexibility in the community to be able to have Montano Monday night at the movies and have some good black and whites out there with popcorn or whatever. It's a great place for it, you know? But, but that's really all it is. I do like the idea of a place of a play area for the kids. Um, a great uh, retail developer in Southern California, uh, Caruso, if you look up CarusoAffiliated.com, in most of Calabasas Commons, the islands down in LA, uh, the, the Grove, beautiful areas, fantastic retail developer. He always has places for kids to play and so forth. The things that I worry about is when you have meeting areas like that and the kids are playing, it becomes a liability. And I don't know how to get around that because you know what everybody's doing these days. Somebody stubs their toe and we're, we're, it's on our property and we've, you know, we've got to deal with it. So I, I'm always open. I want to do what's best for the community. And, and I thought that that's what this would do, but I'm certainly open to suggestions. All right, I, I really, your com the community would really like you to take a look and not putting in the amphitheater for looking at alternatives such as a garden center with benches, uh, possibly a place where people can eat on the rest, eat from the restaurants that you plan, especially with COVID, uh, people are eating outside, you know, that type of thing. That's the kind of thing that will draw people according to the surrounding community. Uh, I, I want to move on to just traffic, and these are all concerns that the subcommittee uh, came up with uh, through contacting the residents. You have a large box store on Latrobe that's within a relatively short distance of a stoplight on White Rock. Now, White Rock road and Latrobe at, as I mentioned before, at rush hour or what used to be rush hour is jam packed. In fact, sometimes cars block the intersection. So we're really concerned that you have only that one, that that is one of the exits and it's gonna dump right off on Latrobe very close uh, to this uh, traffic light on White Rock and uh, Latrobe. The other exits, which is on White Rock that goes into Post, 
I believe Post is a private street. It belongs to uh, it belongs to town center. When you come out of one of the exits that goes into Post, uh, you're going to have a problem there also. All right. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is your other exit, which is supposed to be a right in and a right out. At this time, a numerous cars do not follow the right out. They take a left out and they cross uh, two lanes of traffic, double yellow line uh, to get up to Latrobe. I think you ought to consider uh, putting in some kind of an island, a median, uh, to prevent people from making that kind of a left uh, out on that road. And that, again, is going to, you know, cause a tr uh, tremendous amount of traffic on a road that's uh, congested now, especially the traffic light on Latrobe and then the traffic light on Post. Uh, they're so close together that uh, they cause a considerable backup of uh, traffic. I think you really have to uh, consider the median and uh, other ways of maybe getting traffic in and out of your, uh, of, of your planned uh, location. I went up there the other day and because of the slope on both uh, exits and entrances, it's very difficult for a pedestrian to walk up into that, in, into, into that area. So I would imagine most of the people going in there are going to be going in by car. All right. I, I we do want... we do have ADA ramps from uh, White Rock Road that goes into the plaza. Yeah, I, I saw them, and if I took the ramp, it would take me a day to navigate them because they, <laughs> the way they, the way they're built, uh, it it would it it's not it's not feasible. No one would use it. Uh, the you, other if thing I could I... get a flat site, that would be wonderful, John. Yeah, I know. Well, you, you know, you build a road, you got to do something with it. Uh, the other thing is I noticed in the thing you have uh, blasting may be uh, anticipated because there may be rock. Uh, I want you to keep in mind, and I'm sure the county will keep in mind, that uh, this area has asbestos and uh, that there should be testing for it. We did that, John. Okay. Now, your area, your area, your time for construction, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekends. No now, making now, John, if, if you're going to throw 15 questions at me, you've got to stop at one and let me answer it. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. Go back. What your first question is. Go back. Go back to the <laughs> asbestos then. Okay. We actually did boring samples on the asbestos issue, the serpentine, and uh, it was found that uh, white, uh, that, uh, uh, it was found that um, Town Center has serpentine and it actually stops right at the edge of Town Center moving southbound into our project. And it is completely clear out of, there's a buffer zone that you might sit, call it a buffer zone, where they don't think there's asbestos, but it, there's a buffer zone of say 50 feet or something like that. But just at the point of our phase two development past 36 Handles Pub and moving into the new development where the construction trailer is now, there is no serpentine for the rest of the project. So that doesn't, that doesn't mitigate anything regarding us making sure that uh, we follow proper procedures during construction, but, but, yeah, but it's, it's been proven and, and certified that we don't have serpentine there. Okay. Okay, so, and then, you know, another, the, the next question, that kind of concerns me regarding the traffic. You know, we hired on Kinley Horn and we, we've been dealing closely with the Department of Transportation regarding this. Um, and looking at traffic flow and patterns, circulation. And what we're, what we're looking at is, is that if we do put that lighted intersection on Latrobe Road, it's not going to be any closer to Latrobe Road than it is to going to be to Monte Verde. It's, it's dead center. And we're hoping that with the traffic, that traffic will deviate somewhat to allow, uh, to allow folks to bypass Latrobe and White Rock Road. And in doing so, they, they're going to end up in, in our shopping center and they're going to, 
they're going to hit White Rock Road and be off to uh, Silver Valley Interchange or go directly straight ahead right into uh, into town center. We, we engineered our post street at White Rock Road directly across the street. They don't have to turn or anything. The, the light goes forward and they come and go from town center into Montana. And then, of course, in the future, what we're looking at is, you know, the Supervisor Heidel was talking about the Beltway. Yes, I agree with him that we need the bigger Beltway south of uh, Investment Boulevard, if not connected to Investment Boulevard. But in a small way, we have an opportunity here to, to divert traffic, not only on our side, but on the Jackson property side, which gets us into the future, which is something I probably shouldn't be talking about. But they've already made moves to connect Windplay Boulevard at White Rock Road coming south and connecting up and taking advantage of that new light. So these folks that are coming from South Folsom don't even have to uh, impact Latrobe and White Rock Road. They can have that choice of taking that turn and bypassing. So that, that's our idea on that. And on, on the uh, right in, right out, uh, on south of the site, I think you have a great idea. We don't want vehicles to be crossing traffic. We don't, we don't need another double yellow line. We need to have, uh, you know, we need to have some sort of a barrier so folks who want to break the law and try to cross that double line won't do that. So, you know, that's my idea. You've, you've come up with some, some good things that we need to think about. Uh, just one last thing, uh, talking about construction. Uh, construction on Sundays is not defined anywhere in your plan. Will you be, would you be doing construction on this site on Sundays? Well, you know, I, uh, I, I was going to make a joke out of it, and I don't think I will. But of course, of course. Um, I, I contacted a couple of contractors that is in our line of sight regarding possibly building. Um, one is a scent builder, Scott Kelly. Scott Kelly's been active in the community as well, and he's very well known. And uh, I said, Scott, what would your problem be if we could ratchet back those hours? And he said, Vinyl, he said, at this point, based on the COVID crisis and the fact that we're, the contractors are loosening up and you're, you've got uh, better labor now and better materials because state's going to be fading away to some extent, he goes, we can do whatever you want. He said, but keep in mind, that in the summertime, our folks like to be out there and they like to start early because they don't like to roast in the late afternoon, which I get. And then as, as you move into the winter time, they try to take advantage of the light as it fades so they can have a little bit of light left when they get home. But as far as early in the morning, that's not gonna be an issue. Of course, we're gonna work with you. And nobody likes to be disturbed, you know, waking up on a Sunday morning and listening to uh, you know, heavy equipment. So for, for sure, you know, we're, that's not going to be an issue that we're going to argue with. We're going to work with you on that. So you're, so you're saying you're not going to do construction on Sundays? Yeah, I think I can say that. Okay. All right. All right. I, I, all, of the, all of the things that I happened uh, to mention all came from the subcommittee from APAC. And the vinyl, I thank you for uh, listening to all of this and to consider it. So thank you. Absolutely. And I, I hope I get more questions and I hope that people stay in touch with me. So as we move along on this, by the time we get to the planning commission uh, and then their advisory to uh, Supervisor Heidel, that he's not going to be, he's not going to be grumpy. He's going to, he's going to feel good about what we're presenting to him. So that, that's what I'm looking for. There's too many developers out there that push people away from them and they don't open up and communicate. And so everybody's fired up by the time they get to the, to the planning commission and to the County Board of Supervisors. We need to work together and get this thing figured out. You know, as long as it's, as, as long as it's, uh, you know, uh, something that we can deal with and it's reasonable, let's do this thing together. I'm local. I'm not an out of state developer. I'm, this is what I've done. You know, I think a lot of people like Montana, how it is now, but we're going to make it better. Hey, uh, Tim's been waiting for a while. He has his hand up and then Christy and then Supervisor Heidel. So Tim, jump in. Thank you. Um, you know, John Raz uh, did some of the questions. Uh, now, Vinyl, one of your issues with traffic, you were hoping people were going to turn in um, to your project, drive through on the continuation of Post Street, uh, 
start so pulling in on the trobe and driving at and exiting um, onto uh, White Rock. Um, how wide is your, uh, how many lanes is Post Street going to be as it goes through your uh, project? You know, I'd like to answer that, and I think I have the question, but it's on a map that I can't get to. Uh, <laughs> I have a share screen. You want to try it? Oh, wait a minute. I have it, guys. Somebody okay. unlocked me. Okay, so if I can figure out. Swipe at the bottom, share screen. There you go. Okay, so what we have, if I can get to it, and this is where, uh, you know, I'm working as a lone, Tim, I'm working as a lone ranger right now. Usually I have my civil engineer backing me up and my EIR consultant and whoever can answer questions for us, okay? So, well, we understood. Um, let me see, I need to get to this one. All right, so I don't, you know, I'm going to have to confirm that, uh, Tim, but it's, uh, it, from what I understand, we've got, it's going to be two lanes. It's possible that we could, it's possible it could be four, I don't know. I've got to talk to our, to our uh, civil engineer on that, but, uh, but that's a good question. And another thing, too, is that when I mentioned that vehicles can come through, that doesn't mean that we're going to have a freeway. That just means that they have an opportunity to come through and we're not going to be, uh, you know, Creekside Greens where it's, it's something that we don't want. It's going to be something that we're going to want. It's, it's, it'll be something that where people can come in through the entrance, they're still going to have to go through a roundabout and then head north on that same post street and connect up with White Rock Road. But the whole intent for us liking that is that if we can get people into our shopping center, those are bodies in a shopping center that hopefully is going to stop and buy things. So that's our idea of that. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, just one last thing, what we're also hoping for eventually is that with this lighted intersection being here, that vehicles will have the opportunity to eventually come out and go through Jackson properties and connect up with wind play, which would be very easy to bypass Latrobe at White Rock. Okay. All right. Uh, Chrissy, are you ready? Yeah. Do you want me just to go through that list that I had sent you earlier that were some questions? Yeah, if you want to, if you want to hit, if there's nothing that's been answered yet that you want to. Okay. There you go. Yes. Um, so some of these I feel like might not be directed completely towards the development. So I'm just going to put them out there. And if someone can answer them, that's great. Um, these have been collected from residents in Creekside Greens. Um, they don't come solely from me. So I know that some of them we've discussed through email um, privately and whoever can speak to them so that residents who are tuning in can, can hear it from you guys, um, what the answer to that might be. Um, so the first one was why the wetland preserves in our Creekside Greens residential area was not included in the environmental report. I don't personally know the answer to that. Um, yeah, but there is may I answer that? About, yeah, absolutely. The runoff or. Okay. That was a, that was a, an excellent question. And I consulted with our EIR consultant, Pat Angel, um, at Ascent Environmental on that question. And he said, they, whenever a, an EIR is put together on a particular project, if we don't have, um, if we don't have watersheds or arterials or anything that impacts your watershed or your, your, your environmental area, it's not analyzed. And what we have is we've got a hillside that moves towards the opposite direction. Um, but in terms of, uh, in, in terms of, of drainage, okay, because when you're talking about that, you're also talking about drainage and where does that drainage go? And I would like to, um, and, and there was another question just backing up that said, what is going on south, south of the property on the southern tip? That is where our second basin is going to be for drainage. And what those basins do is they allow enough rainwater and runoff from landscape water and 
whatever that runoff is of that particular development to get into that basin and then filtrate out slower rather than having it hit your environmental areas, it hits your drain, you know, the drains in the public areas all at once. And I'd like to give you an, an example. This was, this is in the parking lot of, of uh, US Bank. This is, our, this is our southern underground basin. Uh, it's aluminum lined underground basin, specifically designed, it's actually overbuilt. We did this in 2012. And if you went out at, in the parking lot of U.S. Bank, that's what you got right underneath that. And this is what we're going to be doing on the southern end of that property as well. So we're from tip to tip, we're going to have adequate basins to handle all of our runoff uh, and have them do their jobs the way they're supposed to. There's not going to be any impact as far as I know. Our EIR consultant can, can better discuss that this, but as far as I know, there's no impact on Creekside Green's environmental area. Okay. And back to you talking about that southern tip, I think residents were concerned that you might be putting another waterfall in that southern tip, or if, if it was a lighted sign for your development, because in yeah. what we were sent, there's a box, and we just didn't know what that was. Yes, there's not going to be any impact there. Uh, that's, like I said, that's where our southern um, detention basin is going to be. Underground, if you remember back in the day, we had a temporary holding tank that was out there that was not very sightly, and we ended up putting it all underground. So um, the only thing that's going to be on that southern tip is we've got a small two-story office building that uh, more than likely is going to be a nine-to-five type of thing, and, uh, you know, financial institution or something like that, but there's, there's not going to be any impact there. Okay, thank you. Um, the next biggest question that keeps coming up is just how traffic is gonna be diverted from our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We do view it as probably going to be used as a cut through. Um, you know, our solutions start out really mild with, could you put a sign that says this is a private residence to try to deter or at least have some sort of backing if there was something to happen. Um, and I know that in an email discussed with John D and, and Tim about a gate being installed um, and, or, and or speed bumps or speed humps or reverse bumps. And if anyone wants to speak to that further, I can just kind of conclude what was written in that email. We are not an HOA. Um, we have no way of paying for a gate uh, maintenance later. And that would become our responsibility. Um, and as far as speed bumps and speed humps go, um, El Dorado Fire does not allow for those to be constructed in residential areas. Anything else from anyone? Well, that's pretty accurate. Um, you know, th that's one of the, <laughs> a lot of HOAs, that's one of their ongoing uh, trouble spots is maintaining the gates or gate access. When something goes wrong, power's out, um, you need to repair. Um, you know, I, I know that there was some suggestion maybe we could talk to Final about you know ideas like that, but ultimately that would come down to the residents maintaining it because it it couldn't be something right. that was assigned as a condition of approval to a development because you know it could be sold later and you know that might break a deal or but uh, and also the other uh, aspect uh, you're correct on the on the speed control devices that EDH fire is on a fan um, it prohibits them generally. Um, I don't know about internally. There's, I think there's some, maybe some old developments that might have uh, that are HOAs, but new projects generally get denied. And Tim might be able to speak to that. Uh, Fireboard Tim, is there anything else on the speed control devices? No, you, uh, you covered it. I would point out though, if the residents uh, would be responsible also for street maintenance, if they gate it and make it a private uh, street and uh, that would require, that can be very expensive. I don't know the state of that street. I drove it about a week ago and it, at least I didn't hit any potholes, but- it was, uh, Yeah, it was repaved a few years ago. Okay, that might be good, but at some point in time, if you gate it, you're responsible right. for uh, all maintenance and improvements uh, and repaving going forward. Tim, um, you know, Chrissy brings up a very good point. Um, I've heard this complaint before. Uh, where vehicles would be cutting through Monte Verde um, and 
I'm hoping that what we're doing and the best way we can design our plaza, we can get those vehicle, those vehicles cutting through our property, not through their property. But I know that, you know, I've done some work, some development work uh, uh, in Folsom, and there's a lot of traffic that cuts through residential areas in Old Town Folsom. You guys have all, all been down there. And there are areas specifically that have signs going into the residential areas that warn people that there will, that, you know, it's private residential areas and uh, possibly, uh, you know, have something that, that states that they could be ticketed or fined if they end up doing that. So uh, I, I understand her concern and, and I would be willing to kind of address that and at least, I, I know if you put a gate up, it changes the whole ball game. They've, you've got to dedicate the land to the residents. It costs them a lot of money. It's a mess. But if at least you put signs up, it, it does wonders. I don't know how many times I've had, I've put signs up in, in, um, in my plaza because I've got vehicles going down the wrong way, you know, through Post Street. And I've had to almost steer them around with a, you know, with a ring in their nose. But the reality is, is that people do end up doing that and we would have no issues whatsoever working with the residents to put something on both ends of, of Monte Verde warning uh, traffic goers that this is not a cut through. And they're gonna have that problem as well when the JPA connector comes through. We're tiny compared to that, you know, so. Yeah, the thing I know that uh, the signs off be cleared with DOT, I'm pretty sure in terms of meeting, you know, GOT standards and what they allow. I know that um, there was a project earlier and I can't remember which one it was, uh, just about having, you know, uh, it was a similar thing, a no parking, uh, you know, this is a residential area. The DOT has to sign off on that and you have to meet their standards. But that's something obviously that could be explored. Um, I was curious, and this is more of a question for Christy, Christy maybe, um, is, is there a significant amount of cut through right now or is the traffic moving up that people don't do it? I, I do not live on Monteverde, but I do feel that there is, you know, I've not done scientific research, okay. <laughs> but I do feel that there is cut through based on um, speeds. And we do have two stop signs that are typically ignored. Um, those could be residents, they really could, but I, I doubt, I tend towards these people are cutting through our neighborhood. Okay. Uh, to skip I hear that. a lot of vehicles park in your neighborhood as well during the 4th of July events. We do. And that's, I, you know, I hate to speak for the residents, but that's something that we accept and we deal with because of our proximity. Um, the concern with the amphitheater is that it could bring in larger events where the overflow parking does come into our neighborhood. We're fine with, with one event a year. If it becomes more events a year, that's when we start to worry. Do you have more, Chrissy? I do. <laughs> oh. Um, okay, moving on to the residential line, fence line. Um, there's been a question if the sound wall, retaining wall, can be um, extended from 8 feet to 10 feet. I know that with the way that the land slopes, I don't quite know what the retaining wall size is as of right now as it goes down. Um, okay, so, so let's there? take a look at that. Can I add just one more oh, thing? Yeah, yeah. It's all kind of encompassed. Um, the easement that's in phase one, residents are wondering if that's going to be extended. And then the privacy measures that you put in on phase one over by the U.S. Bank, um, which I personally went and looked at, I think are pretty phenomenal. I could not see a single window from those re residents that are right next to the U.S. Bank. If those are going to be continued, you have like a privacy netted fence and vines growing and trees and all that jazz. Okay. So that being said, let me see if I can, um, I'd like to uh, show you a couple of things here. Bear with me just for a second. I'm not really good at this. All right, uh, show all windows, okay. Okay, so this is basically what we started with. That is a uh, that is a 30 foot crib wall that's at the White Rock Road entrance, and this is the V ditch that we're responsible for taking care of. Okay, what we ended up with, so this ended up terminating as as you go up the hillside, 
and I'll go ahead and cut out on, oops, I'll cut out on that. Let me see. And just real quick here. So basically, this is really what we want to see. And what, we, what we've got is that when we ended up, if I can get rid of this now. So what we ended up doing after we built US Bank is that we went ahead and built that crib wall and we put landscaping inside of that wall. I mean, on seven different levels, okay? And we did it all the way down to the end of the wall. We put in several, several types of vines that grow rapidly along with uh, Italian cypress. And what we have today, if any of you go take a look at it, is a really beautiful area. I would think you would agree, Chrissy. Mm -hmm. And what we wanna do is continue that crib wall exactly as you see it now with that, with that irrigation all the way until it flattens out. And so what is what the, the site looks like is, is that you've got a, let me see. I'm trying to get the entire site here. If I, if I can read it correctly, it looks like that easement, if that is the easement or the V-ditch as you called it, ends at the middle it, of building four. Yes, it, it does. So what's gonna happen is that you've got this here. Can you see this, Chrissy? Yes. The oh, okay, so I think it would be better if I went ahead and found the, the site plan. Okay, so I'm gonna take this down a little. So what you've got here is that this is the existing crib wall that comes around behind US Bank. Mm -hmm. It starts at 35, 35 feet below grade, and this is right at about a grade of 595 to about six, 600, which is above sea level. These houses are 35 feet below, and then it starts rising all the way up. And by the time you get to the end of the crib wall, these houses are about 15 feet below grade. Okay, so what, what's happening is that as we start building into our, our site plan and start cutting all of our, doing all of our grading, we're actually cutting down and we're exporting about 350,000 yards of dirt. That's a lot of dirt. If anybody needs any dirt in their yard, let me know. Okay, but we're going to be doing a lot of exporting. Um, and so we're immediately going to start going downhill while all these homes go uphill. So by the time you get to uh, just basically at the amphitheater, the houses are down about 10 feet, then it rises up to grade, and then the amphitheater goes down another 20 feet into the hillside. So that, that's gonna be a conversation that we're gonna have moving forward. Uh, but anyway, um, right about, uh, right up, basically, right about uh, this, I think that's uh, building number four. Four You're is at grade. the one in the back. It's this one here. You're right at grade on building on building number two. Okay. Okay, from there, you're going to take a very, very fast slope up. And literally, these houses, by the time you get to the southern edge of the property, are going to be about 35 to 40 feet above the, the center. Okay. So having an eight to 10 foot wall, if, if that were even put in place it wouldn't last long right but what you're going to want to see is landscaping yeah so it really depends on what you want to see something big and tall and that's what you want to see as trees or do you want to see a sunset you know because all those homes that are going to be rising above the center you're going to have that opportunity to, to either see far away or see greenery and you know that's uh, that remains to be seen and just one last thing our buffer zone is 35 feet so we're not going to be building anything within 35 feet of that fence, of that uh, property line to begin with. Okay, but that 35 feet behind building four is a transportation road. Is that just for uh, It's going to be closed off. It's closed, it's closed off. off. Just yeah. for deliveries or? Yeah, for the fire department. <laughs> right, totally. Yeah. 
So it's something that has to be done. We don't want vehicles back there. We don't want uh, arterials to be uh, next to the fence line bothering the residences. We don't need the greenhouse gases. We don't need the headache. Okay. So there, there will be, you know, uh, bollards in place with, with uh, closed off areas. Okay, thank you um, for that. Um, there, I just have two or three more questions here. Sure. Um, that south entrance, I know that you've heard me mention this before, the entrance and exit. Um, and I think I know what your answer is to this based on the conversation we had at APAC. If we, building eight does stay and it becomes a grocery store, I think you were saying that you needed to have an entrance and an exit on both sides of it. That's um, correct. But there is a concern from residents because that entrance on the very southern tip is very close to our one of two entrances and exits out of our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. When White Rock is expanded, we are currently um, only supposed to have a right turn out. So Monteverde and Latro will become a main entrance and exit for us. Um, it's currently, there's like a rock out cropping on the hill there. It's almost impossible to see um, if you are taking a right turn on a, uh, against a red. Uh, are you talking about like right here? On the southern tip, yeah. So there's that entrance exit is about four houses in on our development. There okay. is a concern that it is very close to our entrance and exit um, for us to, and there's no designated right turn lane, I believe, right there, which I know is a, probably a DOT question. Um, but our entrance and exit is currently already tough to get out of, and I know that the light situation will be changing. Um, it's just a concern that that entrance and exit is so close to our entrance and exit. I have a question for you, and yeah. I don't know if this is something that I can solve, but I, I looked at that as well, and um, Tom Purcell Planning brought that up to me. I think you posed that question. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I got that question posed to me. And I was wondering if that, if that is a concern, if possibly doing an, uh, an acceleration deceleration lane from your light to this entrance would be feasible. Yeah, so if there, that, that would actually help you accelerate getting to where you need to be. And yeah. it would also help others decelerate to turn into this existing right in, right out. I think that would definitely be a start. I still feel like if you're using it as an acceleration for us and then someone else in front of you is using it as a deceleration, does that make sense? There's mm -hmm. a jam. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to put that out there that that is a concern that, about that entrance and exit. I had posed it to be an exit only, but I think from the last meeting you had talked about if the grocery store goes in or a big box goes into number eight, building number eight, you have to have an entrance and exit on both sides for safety measures. Yeah. That is correct. And that, that lane actually exists. It's already there. If you take a look at it, it's already, there's already a spot there where you would have that right in, right out entrance. Are you and discussing? To be honest with you, I don't even know where it came from, but it's been there since I've been here. I don't actually, personally, I don't actually see it. Um, there is one down a little bit further where people put their used cars for sale. And is that the one that you're talking they about? Better, they better fine? not, or I'm going to get fined. But uh, I, yeah, to my knowledge, that, that right in, that entrance area exists. I think that there's something that we can, that we can do here. Uh, it, it, it surely helps out the, the shopping center to have another entrance in here. We don't need a, a, full, a full movement spot here, but it sure does help out. You know, just as on the other side, we have a right in, right out on White Rock Road. And that actually helps uh, with the traffic who, it, you know, who, with traffic that's trying to get into the shopping center from the light, you know, people who wanna come in. So they've got two choices to, to get into that shopping center. Um, so, I'm hoping it can stay. It's good for circulation. I'm all ears when it comes to safety. And uh, it's something that we can bring up with our civil engineers to see if we can have a solution. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, last, I think my last question um, is where are your dumpsters located or um, 
disposal bins located okay, on the so property? We've got them all lined up against the, the back and they're gonna be dumping at six in the morning on Sundays. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> <That's> not funny. <laughs> no, it's, uh, okay, so what we have is a conceptual site plan and we're going in, actually this is all for an EIR certification. Once we get into the weeds and we start really getting into the, the overall site plan, we're gonna get, planning is gonna continue to be involved the uh, building department's going to get involved. All the codes get involved. Um, uh, the fire department is going to start telling us exactly where, where they need to have those, those dumpsters. We need to, so we've got certain constraints on this heavy equipment that comes in that dumps these, these guys out. Um, but we're going to be following protocol. We're going to have our, our, um, our CMU walls, you know, that's built up just like in the existing shopping center. We're going to do everything that we can to keep them away from the residential areas, you know, from being along the back wall. If we can, if we can place these dumpsters into the body of the, of the new phase, that's where we're going to really end up focusing on, on this. And in, in saying that, no, we don't have locations really for those dumpsters yet, specific locations. This site plan is going to change a little bit as we go into construction drawings. And goes through the plant, goes through the building department and gets scrutinized. Okay, thank so, you. Um, we do have concerns about the amphitheater, but I know that John has already touched on those, um, and it is about the hours um, and about decibel level. Um, so those have been expressed already, but those were also large questions um, from. Residents. Also, please remember, you know, we have codes and code enforcement. Right. They're, they're, you know, if you have complaints, you can always call code enforcement. And uh, we would get written up if we've got a development agreement that says that we've got to abide by certain decibel levels. Mm -hmm. And also remember, it's the owner of the property that's handling that amphitheater. It's not a tenant like Relish Burger Bar. Okay. And then one last question, and I really appreciate your time in answering all these questions. Um, during the construction phase, which is three years long, uh, if we have a complaint about how construction is being handled, we as in the residents, where do we report that? Okay, uh, one, code enforcement, two, planning. I actually asked our planner this um, a few days ago. You can call planning, code enforcement, you could call me, um, and, it's, you know, I think you get more results of those three rather than calling the sheriff. The sheriff would say, call the owner, call for code enforcement, call the county. But okay. we're, we're going to have to live up to many, many conditions, at, at, you know, moving forward. If we're lucky enough to get this, the, the rest of the shopping center off the ground. And uh, I'm not interested in, in breaking the laws and doing something that's going to make, you know, the, the residents ticked off at me. We need you to come over and buy stuff. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much for answering all of our questions, even ones that aren't related to the EIR. That's okay. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you. I do see a supervisor for hot dogs been waiting. His hand's been up. Uh, John, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Um, and Vinyl, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. You've always been one of the most open um, developers we've dealt with in terms of sharing information and trying to find solutions. And as a community, we really appreciate that because the more flexibility you have, to meet the, the residents' needs and to look at everything in a, in a little different perspective from their eyes. Um, we end up with a much, much better project and I think in the long term, it makes for a compatible environment between residential and commercial properties where they butt right up against one another. You do have a buffer, but it's a pretty minimal buffer. The one thing um, I would encourage you to do is to, is to consider uh, moving away from the idea of the amphitheater there's a long held uh, stigma in El Dorado Hills that an amphitheater is a large gathering for loud music. And I don't think that's the intent of what you're trying to do with this project. So I would, I would encourage you to consider something more like an entertainment oriented gazebo. And I've seen these in the South and I in have other, to, John. other yeah, areas yeah. in Hawaii and stuff. They're a yeah. gathering place. You can do stage presentations. It's a 360 type of venue. You can put chairs out in different areas, but, but a gazebo is a gathering place where an amphitheater is a place for loud entertainment is the way it's read. So it's not just what yeah. you call it, it's how you design it. But I think that kind of a concept might fit better with the public's uh, desire for something of that type. And like I said, I can, I can give you any number of examples. 
or I've seen in parks and, and large cities and stuff where those kinds of gazebos are very much used and very much appreciated. There is maintenance involved, uh, but they're a high utility, very attractive type of feature typically. With I, I wouldn't even mind getting a wedding there. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there are weddings. I mean, there are gazebos set up for small weddings. There are gazebos that are set up for entertainment, for, mm -hmm. you know, small bands. Yeah. To you know, Supervisor Heidel, that's exactly what I'm trying to get at here. Yeah. Uh, this, I'm not trying to compete with Town Center, and I'm not trying to compete with, with the, the music at the park. It's, uh, this is just something where I want a small number of people within the community to have the opportunity to choose our plaza to come in and enjoy themselves. As I said during the Planning Commission workshop, uh, you know, your choices as a developer are to build something bland and people end up going to your competition or buying online or you're gonna build something that's going to be nice enough for people to wanna to come visit each other. And when they visit each other, maybe they'll go buy a dress or they'll go do something and they'll visit the plaza. I, I want a, an experience when people come to the rest of this plaza. I, I kind of hit it in the first phase, but I didn't have enough gross leasable area with enough of a choice. And what I'm looking for is something that can be compatible with town center something that people are really proud of in this community that can come in and see what we've done here with even more architectural design that we have than we have now. And something that people can talk about in Folsom Ranch, instead of talking about Palladio, they'll talk about coming across county line and come see us. So that's all, that's all I'm looking for. Yeah, I think when you label amphitheater, people think of loud events and music. Yeah, I think that's a lousy word. <laughs> yeah, I do too. And, and they're, they're concerned that while you have it and control it or whoever it is, that may be fine, but then you get a new owner and the total, the venue changes and things just get out of control. So if it's yeah. more of a community, small entertainment based thing and bears the right kind of uh, definitions, then I, then I think you're, you're going to find it's a much more compatible a theme to fit within that kind of a development. So well taken, sir. I, I really want to think about that and see what we can do. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have one more hand up, and I don't see a name. I see a uh, it's L4 hand, and I've uh, muted you. There you are. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Hi. Good evening. So a couple of things I was looking was um, the blast vibrations. We have individuals that have pools and other entertainment in the back of their houses. Um, the blast uh, suggestions, some of them are a chemical-based uh, removal of the rock, and some of them are an expansion removal of the rock. And in those two things that, um, if that changes from a blast to a chemical, are the neighbors gonna be notified what chemical it is? Um, if they're doing the expansion, uh, will we be notified when that's occurring? It does say there'll be notification during the blast um, if there's any concern of the times of the blast, what way do we get to communicate besides the posted order um, of the blast? I, I know there was someone that's like a sound person listed there um, of any concerns that we have or, you know, you don't necessarily want your kids in the pool when there's blasting going on. Yeah, we actually did address that in the EIR and I have got a page on it, uh, but I'm not going to go searching for it right now. Um, we hired on a company called Bullard Acoustical, and they uh, specialize in blasting. They specialize in sound, noise, decibels, and, and uh, materials that you put in your walls and certain ways that you could kill the, the transmission of noise. That, and, and, and it also goes back to vibrations that can crack your pool, all right? So there are codes. Um, whether it be county, state codes, CEQA codes that do address those issues. And the last thing that any developer wants to get himself into is uh, being accused of cracking somebody's walls or hurting somebody's house, breaking somebody's, you know, uh, or being accused of, of uh, a swimming pool getting cracked. So we're going to be very, very careful about how we work this. And it's going to be a, a, according to to law and according to code, it is going to come up. And I highly suggest that you put that in writing as I do everyone else who's got questions, put it in writing to the planning commission. So we can, so we can debate that when we have our civil engineers there. So I would be just as concerned as you. And I like the question and I think it needs to be, 
it needs to be brought up again. We need to all be comfortable with how it's being done. Awesome. Okay. Great. Thank you for answering that one. And then I had one other question um, and it's regarding the traffic again. And I know the DOT isn't here to answer it, but when you're coming down from um, heading east on White Rock Road and you are have crossed across um, Latrobe and now we have what I call um, a staggered stop, go stop, um, we have a section right before, right after Monte Verde that um, has not been extended, that should have been extended when the overpass was created at the um, next exit, which is the uh, Serrano Parkway, Silva Valley Parkway, sorry, um, overpass. And it was not done, um, it wasn't included, and now it's still there. And when we turn right out of there, when school time or... Um, the traffic pattern is busy because of commuters. Um, it becomes actually very dangerous. And adding on top of that now, another post street uh, occurrence of more, you know, right turns out of there. And we can only turn right when this is finally developed and done to like take our kids to school at Oak Meadow or to the high school or junior high. It, it's worrisome that we might be moving forward with that development before that area that was designed to be actually six lanes that got reduced down to four lanes is not been completed. And also having sidewalk access all the way through there for families, children through our park area. And I know that's not necessarily on the developer side, but I do think it's a, a, a constriction part of the flow. And I don't think it's showing reflective um, completely because I think that it was assumed and planned that that would be already four lanes by now. I'd like to answer your question, but you got me a little lost. I've never, I've never heard that concern before, and I'm not sure where you're talking. It would be nice to see a, a map or a, a site plan or something. Maybe if, 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 if you have your post street entrance and exit. On Latrobe? On Latrobe. Okay. Um, well, there's the Latrobe and White Rock Cross. And if you head east on White Rock Road and continue going to our Monte Verde exit, so it's the north side of the property. There okay, is so it's a, White Rock, not Latrobe. It's White Rock. White Rock after Latrobe, so eastbound from Latrobe. Right there, when it goes to that park, it reduces down to just two lanes. It's mm -hmm. not four lanes there. So it has a yield into the lane. And when we come from the left-hand turn lane off of Latrobe onto White Rock, and we are headed into a right turn into Monte Verde to go into our neighborhood, right there, people come out of or go into that first entrance of your property and slam on their brakes, which then it jacks us up in that right-hand outside lane. And then we go through the light, and then we go to go forward, and people in the left lane will speed up thinking that we're trying to cut them off. And what happens is, is that when the person's turning from the right lane out of there to go like take their kid to school, it causes a whole bunch of, because there should really be a light there and we can't have a light, light, light. It won't happen. So we can only turn right. And so far there, the constriction shouldn't be there because it should be us turning right onto a lane that's there for us. We don't, we have to turn right and go out into another lane. So we're crossing two lanes that are yielding at the same time and really and truly if you haven't seen it, you need to drive it and, and do it during commute. I'll have to look at that. I was kind of wondering what what it's going to look like once the JPA connector gets gets there. Because as far as I know, we're probably within a year. Maybe Supervisor Heidel could let us know. But we're, I think we're within a year of expanding out White Rock Road all the way to the Silver Valley Interchange, aren't we? Unfortunately, no. Um, really? A lot of the stuff that's happening in El Dorado County, since El Dorado County doesn't contribute to the tax measure that everything is being built in Sacramento County to, we're relying on federal funding to be able to, to do the, the improvements right at the, the Sacramento County line, El Dorado County line, all the way down to where Latrobe Road is. That's part of the connector improvements, but it requires the funding piece of it. The other segment she's talking about coming out of town center it's two lanes now, has been planned as four lanes for a long, long time. It's part of our capital improvement project. I keep talking to our director of transportation saying this should have been built a long time ago and they keep moving it out in the planning phases. So 
Um, we're trying to pull that back in, but the one thing that's gonna be the major trigger point for that as I see it is if Costco files an application and starts right. moving forward and I have the director of DOT's agreement that once that happens, all those projects in that immediate area have to move to the front of the list within our CIP to get completed. Otherwise, we're creating huge bottlenecks and traffic hazards and safety hazards that yeah, you know, absolutely, now, but haven't been so. Yeah, and, and you know, just a FYI, that whole uh, uh, grass area in front of U.S. Bank, yeah. that's not owned by us. That's owned by county, but we maintain it. So yeah, we that's what we've been doing, and and actually, the last time that we when, when uh, White Rock Road actually expanded out past our main entrance on White Rock Road, we were given about two weeks notice after we planted our brand new crepe myrtles and put in all of our irrigation and was given 10 days to two weeks notice that they were rolling in there and expanding it out. And literally, we didn't have time to rip out our trees or anything. They just came in and, and it was done. And now, now we've got a development agreement to maintain the grassy area in front of Monte Verde until they can get the additional lanes. So I, I don't know how to answer that. The other part I want to mention is that's exactly where that part that you're talking about that's developed and then Craig's lay is right there. That's exactly where our bus stops and picks up our children from our whole neighborhood. And so on top of it, you have that, that lane going down. You have a bus there that puts a out a stop that. sign. Sure. People turn right and they have nowhere to go except a stoplight. And um, it's just a concern that if we do develop this area, are we going to put a, a divot in for the bus to pull in, a covered area for our kids to be, and get them away from the main part of that drag of that road once it be does become four lanes, because it will be more like a small freeway rather than a neighborhood drive area. So I just I would imagine that. that would be part of the JPA connector slash Costco. Um, well, actually, the JBA connector work really stops at Latrobe Road. Everything on the other side, east of Latrobe Road, is on the county. So okay. it is a continuation of the connector because the connector goes all the way to Silver Valley Parkway, yeah. but it's really the county's responsibility. That's the CIP budget. Yes, to make those improvements. And so we just have to continue to push for that. So, yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah, that's where right the, the reduction comes in there and then goes. To a, there's a creek that goes through here from town center into our neighborhood. We have a pond and it is, it's going to have to be expanded. It's going to be quite a bit because you've got to do the underground structure. Yeah, right through here. Yeah, and then the bike lane's got to continue. And then what also is, is there's another, you know, two businesses on this other left-hand side of that. And then right there on the other side of the, if you back up a little bit, is where the bus stops, where the pavement is, where they're sitting on the sidewalk. Um, on the left there, go left a little bit more. Um, from the back? On the left, right there. Right there where that X was, or the arrow, that's where our kids stand to get on the bus. And so it's right before the restriction goes down of the roadway to a two lane, and it should be a four lane there. And then also you notice there's no sidewalk on that side. So to cross the road, and there's no crosswalk or anything there that shows that there could be people going across the road there at all. We what side is what side is no crosswalk? No, 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 no sidewalk here. We have a park there, and then we also have, as you can see, where the the sidewalk ends. There's no way for the kids to continue walking to the elementary school, and there's also no crosswalk that goes. To oh the yeah, right here. Or to get on the other side to then walk to Target. Well, and the only way that they could do that is they would have to walk back to the entrance at Montano and cross there, because we have crosswalks here. Correct. That's where we have to walk. But what I'm saying is on the other side, if you notice there across from the post office, there's no sidewalk there either. And that goes in front of the Sherwin Williams or the, the rock store. So it doesn't start until you get to the next set of buildings. So it's just one of those things that it's not all the developer, but it is no. cognizant of the, the DOT and traffic pattern that I don't think has been taken into account appropriately at this time because yeah. the plan showed that this would all be four lanes throughout here and go into that easement that you see is in front of the park. Yeah, that sidewalk should have continued on across Burko and Sherwin-Williams. Yep. And then the next property is owned by, by Mansoor and that should have been connected up here on that side. I see, I see that. Okay. Well, that's, we're, we're getting late here. We're after nine, but uh, Brooke did have a question. I want to see if, uh, let's see, are you unmuted? How about now? There you go. Okay. 
Well, thanks. I'll make it really quick. It was just following up on some of the points that were made. And if there is an opportunity to reconsider the amphitheater, um, one of the things that attracts so many of my friends to town center is the kids ability to play and run around over there by the pond and look at the turtles. Um, but I know through experience at some of the other developments throughout California, if you have um, a kid's attraction, um, not necessarily a playground, but an area where they can gather and play that parents have 360 views, it is such an attractive feature. Um, and I think it would draw a lot of people to the development, especially to go eat and to go shop. So those are my two cents as far as reconsidering the amphitheater. Brooke, trust me, I love mothers with strollers. <laughs> That's it. The stroller strides would come and do their stroller stride program there, um, especially if you put a little bit of grass where they can yeah. do. Some I do have stuff. grass there, actually. Yeah, and I think that I, I'm kind of a, a little bit excited about um, Supervisor Heidel's idea um, where we can do a little bit of a quasi um, gazebo area where, you know, you might have something small, but at the same time, we have other attractions where moms can bring their kids and, and so forth. And honestly, I'm going to have to find out what our liability issues are with that, but I would love to see it. I really would. It's also something in the day and age that we are in now with COVID, um, outdoor eating um, is something also too. The patio space um, is a huge draw to not have to necessarily sit indoors. Well, so. unfortunately, I think by the time I finally get this built, COVID is going to be in the rearview mirror. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> but it brings up some very good ideas. Well, thank you for your so. time. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the appreciate the comment. Well, um, we are late, and I want to thank you again, Vinyl, for uh, participating two months in a row at length. Um, you know, you're very engaged. The community the community appreciates that. Um, we're looking forward to seeing how this goes through the process, how the inputs received. Yes, um, we do have a subcommittee that's been working on it. Chrissy and John Reslier have been doing a lot of work. Uh, I thought we were pretty close with the report they had assembled, but there's some more questions. You know, we might have answered some of those questions tonight, but we want to fold them in to make an informed response to the uh, draft EIR. And we'll, you know, our plan is to get that in before the the, co uh, the comment period deadline. Um, I think that what we're going to do is we'll have the subcommittee and uh, voting APAC members meet a separate meeting. We'll do it in Zoom uh, where it'll be recorded. So, I mean, we'll invite you if you have time. That's great. But basically, I always have time. Good. I wish I did. Um, but we'll basically, um, <clears throat> review the subcommittee report offline and then take a vote and have a little discussion about if that's how we want to present our comments if, and if there's anything we want to change. So I appreciate I that. And, and I'd like to state that, that, you know, the, uh, most of these comments are going to come up at the planning commission yeah. and many of them are going to be vetted out. A lot of them are going to be ending up uh, in uh, supervisor Heidel's lap along with all the other supervisors. And I can just tell you that I was always brought up a little bit different than other developers. Without your support, I don't have a development. I've seen too many fail because the developer didn't listen. And so if we can be reasonable and you're reasonable with me and I'm reasonable with you and that we all agree because we all want the same thing, let's get it done. And we're going to be happy and we're going to build this thing together. So I appreciate your time, everybody. Well, we appreciate you, uh, you know, participating to the extent that you have. Not every developer does that, so we appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Awesome. So with that, uh, unless there's anything else, um, I will say that our next meeting, I believe, uh, it's August, is it 13? Hold on. I'm going to tell you. It's August 12th at 7 p.m. I imagine we'll be doing this virtually again. Uh, I don't see a change coming up soon. It would be nice to sit down with everybody again. Uh, it would be nice to shake hands again. But um, right now, the, it looks like it'll be virtual again. We'll send the notification out as we always do. I want to thank everybody tonight for participating. Thank you for our subcommittee. John Heidel has something for us. Yeah, just, just a reminder that our uh, community council meeting will be next mm -hmm. Monday. Uh, we deferred it a week as we had some conflicts with what's going on to be able to run the Zoom meeting. But uh, yeah, Monday, we've got the agenda out. If you haven't received the agenda and are interested, please contact my office. We'd be glad to add, add you to the distribution list. A lot of things to talk about. So we look forward to seeing everybody back Monday. 
yeah, you'll hear me again on Monday. Uh, that is also on the APAC website and it's listed under advanced the, the uh, agendas there as well. We share that on our social media. So uh, thank you everyone for attending tonight. It's late. Um, we appreciate everyone's participation and we look forward to seeing you again in August. So uh, with that, uh, we are adjourned and good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Good night.